Today I want to talk about the relationship between morally blaming somebody and legal liability. There is an important overlap, but there are exceptions and distinctions between the two as well. So <clears throat> in discussing the, the overlap between moral blame and legal liability, I would like to suggest that they're both based on Aristotle's excusing conditions. Aristotle talks about two basic types of excuses which mitigate a person's blame for a harmful action. The first, lack of knowledge, is in the law identified through the uh, categories of mistake and accident. And of course, the issue in both frameworks will be, is that lack of knowledge itself culpable? Or was the person in denial about relevant facts? Okay, the second criterion for moral and legal blame boils down to the lack of voluntariness. And here we'll see that with reference to the criminal statutes, this consists primarily of coercion, threat, and duress, and excludes, for the most part, any type of uh, internal mental states that cause a, an action to be less than fully voluntarily voluntary, OCD, for example, but short of legal insanity. <clears throat> now, with reference to what the standards for legal liability are, we can take account of the notion of mens rea. Mens referring to the mind or the mental state. Rea means thing, the state of the mind. However, the four mens rea that are operative in American criminal law include intentionally doing something, purposely doing something, uh, uh, first degree murder, knowingly doing something, which in a lot of respects resembles foreseeability. For example, uh, a military strike, for example, uh, near a hospital in Syria intended to destroy a uh, ISIS group, the individuals, the army or paramilitary, whoever bombed near the hospital would know that people in the hospital, innocent victims would die, but they didn't intend, it wasn't their purpose to kill innocent victims in the hospital. So there has to be a mens rea separate from intentionally doing something, given that so many actions are done which cause serious crime without the perpetrators wanting, intending, or having that purpose to do that serious crime. Now, the other two mens rea operative in American uh, criminal law are negligence and recklessness. These two pertain less to the state of mind that existed as an intentionality of foreseeability, but rather the lack of the state of mind that needed to have been there. So we've got negligent, uh, negligent homicide. Negligence is defined less in terms of the state of mind that is present than in the failure to think and act and judge in accordance with what the reasonable person would know and would have done. So it's not that there's any kind of present mental state that exists that's the basis for criminal blame, but the state of mind, the reasonable person standard, that doesn't exist. Similarly, with the uh, criminal uh, mens rea of recklessness, that's you know, the extreme uh, careless inadvertence of, of a serious risk. Um, and of course, with these latter two, negligence and recklessness, it's very important that the actual circumstances of the action be considered rather than merely the state of mind uh, that may not have existed. But given the circumstances, reasonable behavior was expected. Now, getting back to the issue for today's lecture, what's the connection between moral blame and legal blame? Well, the two Aristotle, Aristotelian excusing conditions that will mitigate blame, lessen it, 
not exculpate, eliminate it. Those are defenses, not excuses. The defense of self-defense doesn't just excuse an act, it justifies the action being done, all things considered. Okay, so we're asking, um, are the criminal law statutes and criteria for liability an exact mirror image of moral responsibility? Well, let's look at a couple uh, categories in which they don't overlap. For example, we know the, uh, the uh, maxim, ignorance of the law is no excuse. And we'll look at that a little more carefully when we look at Aquinas' natural law. Ignorance of the law is no excuse means that every capable adult is expected to know that certain actions are harmful by the time they reach adulthood. Uh, stealing, murder, rape, assault, theft, etc. Both frameworks, of course, assume that young children and developmentally disabled people are exceptions to the ignorance of the law is no excuse. Um, however, both will consider culpability, culpability for your ignorance, but one focuses, that is moral blame focuses more specifically on the individual's blame. Here's an example. Drunkenness or drug addledness uh, being too high will affect our uh, attributions of moral blame. For example, the first time a person gets drunk, we wouldn't blame them because they wouldn't have uh, been able to predict how their behavior would have caused harm. Or we might argue that the last time a person is drinking in a stage of, for example, delirium, withdrawal, uh, uh, and of course, the kind of dementia that comes with late stage alcoholism, for a moral, from a moral point of view, we might not blame persons that do harm when they're drunk or extremely high. But the criminal law has an ineliminable forward-looking basis to it. And I wanna talk about does that basis exist in the moral blaming framework. So the aims of the criminal law include forward-looking aims such as deterrence. So we have criminal statutes against drunken driving, DUIs, drunk and disorderly behavior because we don't want those behaviors to reoccur on the part of the individual or on the part of the group. Okay, so there's a uh, deviation with drunkenness. The only things that count in the law as far as involuntary behavior are coercion, threat, and duress. Now, does that mean that other than these three categories, we are ignoring what the voluntary standards and involuntary standards are in the moral blaming framework? Absolutely, because as I've mentioned in a previous lecture, when we morally blame somebody because of its involuntariness, we need to consider that voluntariness, purely voluntary, and involuntariness, purely involuntary, exist at two ends, two extreme ends of a continuum. And in the moral blaming framework, I argued that involuntariness is interpreted as having no reasonable alternatives to do otherwise. And of course, uh, in the cases of coercion, threat, and duress, uh, these are, there are obviously no re reasonable alternatives. And in the moral blaming framework, a fully voluntary action would consist of a number of reasonable alternatives. Yet, those uh, criteria of uh, purely and in, purely voluntary and purely involuntary in the moral framework don't have a, a correlative in the legal blaming framework because of the aims of criminal punishment. When we get to the uh, next discussion of the aims of criminal punishment, they include deterrence, both special deterrence, 
the effect of punishment on people that have already been incarcerated, and general deterrence, the effect of punishment on the general law-abiding population. So we've got deterrence, rehabilitation, communication. Communication means the um, educative assumptions about punishment. And of course, with the exclusion of uh, being real high or being real drunk in the legal framework, the fact that these are criminalized is basis is has a basis not only in deterrence but also in the communicative ideal of punishment that we communicate to people with addiction problems that <clears throat> these behaviors won't be tolerated and finally uh, protection while people are in jail the larger non-incarcerated population will be protected <clears throat> Now, does that mean that we have a distinction between the moral blaming framework and the legal blaming framework based on one being exclusively backward looking? Was the person really to blame? And forward looking considerations like communication and deterrence. Well, Joel Feinberg, a prominent American legal philosopher, argues that the moral blaming framework also is forward looking. And that shows that there's a commonality between the two. From Feinberg's point of view, the moral blaming framework operates when someone harms us intentionally, knowingly, negligently, or uh, <clears throat> recklessly. And because of those factors, they are to be held blameworthy. However, there's a distinction between this record keeping on the part of an individual in the personal realm and the accounting that's done by the courts in gathering evidence of legal liability in the realm of criminal law. Both are a way of record keeping regarding a person's reliability. So, with respect to the personal realm of moral blaming, one possibility of it being more expansive is based on the fact that we know so much more about individuals that wouldn't be relevant in the courtroom. For example, we may know about that person's problems with addiction. We may know about their problems with OCD. We may know about their intestinal issues that uh, cause them a great deal of pain and acting less than fully reasonably. We may know uh, about their history and habits, and we may know how difficult it is to change for that person to transform. But all these factors can be irrelevant to legal responsibility as it's interpreted in the courtroom. But as Feinberg points out, it also contains a forward-looking element because based on our keeping a record of who's to blame and for what, we will make future decisions based on their reliability in terms of acting reasonably. Okay, the second set of issues I want to, want to bring up are based on the fact of, is the content of the criminal law a mirror image of the content of the moral blaming framework? And uh, students, several, several students ask that question in the form of who's to know or who's to decide whether this action is blameworthy or not. Well, there's an interesting uh, philosophical and sociological uh, theoretical framework that answers that question. In sociology, Emile Durkheim. In philosophy, we've got Jeffrey Ryman and traditional Marxists. So uh, Ryman's answer and the Marxist answer is that the most harmful actions might not be criminalized. Uh, current examples of toxic dumping, which we know uh, can cause serious uh, 
problems uh, in terms of cancers, brain damage, uh, the distribution, for example, of unsafe water in the Flint area. We know that oftentimes corporate wrongdoing results in serious harm, yet there are so, so many exceptions as far as corporate malfeasance that it's very rare for a CEO uh, who is in charge of a corporation and whose actions, either in terms of an unsafe workplace, toxic dumping, um, et cetera, have not been uh, sent to prison as a result of corporate wrongdoing. Okay, so the most harmful actions may not be criminalized because from a Marxist point of view, the criminal law, the, all the legal norms, the social norms, the moral norms, the social institutions are part of a, what uh, Marx called a superstructure. The superstructure is everything that a society institutionalize, institutionalizes or holds uh, as a valid belief that is an emanation, an outgrowth of the economic base. The economic base consists of the economic relationships between certain economic classes. So in the Marxian uh, framework, these economic bases throughout history have been varied. Um, the serfs with respect to uh, the uh, early modern period or middle, medieval times, feudalism that is, capitalism, communism, socialism, uh, slave-holding societies, all these are defined by the relationship, for example, between workers and owners, the government and the citizens. And from a Marxist point of view, whoever is the ruling economic class is the determinant who decides what's in these What's the content of these other institutions? So, for example, when it comes to some of our moral norms, for example, about uh, it's it's uh, immoral to steal, that would be based on possibly uh, a relationship of private property. In, for example, in capitalism, in a full blown communist state, there are no, uh, there is not supposed to be a state and there's not supposed to be private property. So stealing wouldn't be an issue. Property is communally held. Okay, so what about the uh, social norm regarding truthfulness? Well, that's taken uh, into account in many uh, economic systems. Uh, an example in a capitalist system is that a contract is void if it's based on fraud, if it's based on deception or lying. The economic relationships account for the religious norms and practices. Uh, a good example, the separation of church and state can be traced to the idea from Christianity, render unto Caesar, uh, or Judaism, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God. And then when we come to the legal norms, the criminal law doesn't include uh, many forms of seriously harm producing actions. For example, currently we have over 200,000 people that have died from COVID-19 and we haven't suggested uh, criminal liability yet. So the model of crime, according to, uh, again, talking about um, Ryman, that we operate on as a paradigm in our own uh, capitalist democratic system is based on the belief that the paradigm of a criminal action, a paradigm of harm producing actions is one on one street crime. Even though the harm to human lives and property is much greater as a result of corporate wrongdoing. So the way Durkheim describes this relationship between what gets punished, what gets criminalized, and what's in the moral blaming framework. What is it? Um, a mirror image. Is the criminal law a mirror image of any society's moral views? He claims not. That the purpose of the criminal law from Durkheim's point of view is to separate society into two groups. Those that are law abiding and those that are not. And this, this has the function of 
allowing people to regard themselves as vested in acting right, righteously and legally. And another group of people, those that have faced criminal punishment as a scapegoat, the one-on-one -on -one street criminals, as a scapegoat for all the harms uh, and losses, property damage that we incur in our society. So its function is to provide this solidarity among law abiders uh, so that there can be a distinct visible group of uh, wrongdoers that have to face incarceration. In conclusion, I intended for this lecture on the relationship between moral blame and legal responsibility to give you some insight into some of the cases we're going to look at as to whether the uh, defendants were really to blame from a moral point of view. And I described the difference between these four mens rea, intentionality or purposefulness, knowing, knowingly doing something or uh, foreseeing it, negligently or recklessly doing something, they have more purposes than merely uh, blaming somebody and uh, deciding whether you want to interact with them again based on that blame. So that concludes the lecture on the relationship between moral blame and legal responsibility.